What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in true crime. And today we dive back into the OG story uh, for our show, Surviving the Survivor. Of course, we are talking about the Dan Markell murder case. Uh, this is how we started our entree into true crime. Uh, he is, for those who do not know, the Harvard-educated FSU law professor who was gunned down in his Tallahassee driveway back in 2014, where attorney Tim Jansen is coming to us from. Uh, and this week, sadly, marks nine years since his cold-blooded murder. Two hitmen and a go-between, a female, Katie Magbanawa, are already convicted of the crime, and they are in prison. Our best guests are here to break it all down, and this is an all-star panel uh, for this topic, we've got famed Tallahassee defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen. Uh, he is a partner in the firm that bears his name, Jansen and Davis. He's handled all kinds of complex civil, administrative, and criminal litigation, and he spent five years as a federal prosecutor. No one, and I mean no one, knows the Tallahassee legal community better than Tim Jansen, who is back from his little vacay. Uh, then we've got in the bottom left hand corner, uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired Carl Steinbeck. He was a JAG in the military for nearly 30 years. He now has his own defense firm, the Steinbeck Law Firm. He hosts his own YouTube channel, Jury Trial Mentor, with his brother, who is here as well, John Steinbeck, a great guy. The brother Steinbecks are joining us today. Judy Tseng, she's not here yet. She's the founder and owner of the Wake Law Office. She has a YouTube channel, Asian American Legal Focus. She's been following this case uh, extensively, and she's going to join us at about 40 minutes after the hour. As if that is not enough, True Lifestyles, otherwise known as Susan Harmon. Uh, she's coming to us, breaking down uh, almost weekly on her own YouTube channel, Jailhouse Calls from Charlie Adelson to People on the Outside. She's going to tell us what she has dug up. And last, but certainly not least, in what appears to be a St. Louis Cardinals baseball cap, no, Preston no. Scott. No, what is that? That's not St. Louis, Louis Cardinals. Cardinals. What is that? Is that Tallahassee? What is it? Florida State. Florida, oh, Florida State. How can I be so dumb? No okay. one's wearing St. Louis Cardinals hats these days. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Joel, that's an homage to Dan Markell, who is an FSU law professor. There you go. I love it. I love it. And uh, that's your team, guys. Uh, Preston Scott is the host of the morning show with Preston Scott in Tallahassee. Uh, he's lived there since 87 and hosted the Preston Scott show since 2002. All these people have been on the hunt for justice for Dan Markell. Uh, Ruth Markell, a friend of the show and someone I've had the privilege of becoming friends with personally, uh, sent a statement. She wanted everyone uh, who is part of STS Nation uh, to know uh, what she had to say today. Uh, shout out to Maui Swift, nine years, she says. Uh, Maui is an original viewer of the show. But Ruth Markell's statement, and I quote, Please thank all your guests tonight for championing, championing Dan's memory now and always. Our family is so appreciative of the support and your efforts in the community your focus on the criminal system and offering information on the case is an inspiration to us. We are so grateful to this network of allies who have put so much heart and energy into the pursuit of justice. Many, many thanks, Ruth Markell. Um, Tim Jansen, you know, you've uh, handled a, a lot of high profile cases. Um, back to Ruth for a moment. What do you think? Um, the family is going through nine years later. You know, people have a tendency to call them anniversaries. Anniversaries are happy occasions. Certainly not a happy occasion. Uh, it's been nine years of hell for her uh, trying to get justice. Uh, give us a glimpse into into what you think the family has been dealing with this whole time. You, you really can't step in their shoes. Um, it's a never ending horror that never ends. Every day, I'm sure she's hoping for justice. Every day, she's probably thinking this is a dream, a nightmare that's not real. Uh, we wish it was. Um, this was a horrible, tragic event. Um, and it was clearly a deliberate action by persons. Some that had been convicted. Some that was very personal. Others, it was just 
making some money, but the family, she'll never be the same. The family will never be the same. Um, and it's horrible. Um, the justice system has two sides. You have the prosecution and you have the defense. Usually both sides suffer on criminal cases. And when someone is killed or physically hurt, harmed, both sides suffer. Um, and the lawyers, it, these are hard cases to represent cases like this. Because you know, a lot of times, a lot of times it's not a matter of did the person do it, it's what's the penalty gonna be. And that you can never, most victims, the death penalty should be given out in every case, uh, even when someone doesn't die. And on the other side, you're defending someone and trying to get justice. So I feel bad for the family. Uh, Preston, do you believe this should be a capital case? Oh, without a, without a doubt. Yeah. You know, I sat on a grand jury here in this county uh, that handled exclusively capital cases for six months while doing my radio program. It was, it was really an odd six month period of time um, because stories that we, you know, routinely might discuss on my show, I'm getting inside details that I could never discuss, never have discussed or revealed. But from the very beginning, and I think we've talked about this in previous uh, visits, Joel, this case provided more circumstantial evidence than virtually any other case I'd ever seen that we voted uh, that, the, that the state had probable cause to go forward with a capital case. And uh, Preston, you host the morning show. You've been on top of this case basically from the get go. Uh, has public interest waned at all? Is it picking back up uh, with Charlie's trial around the corner? Uh, how do you measure it at this point? I think Tim would probably agree with me that it's largely kind of gone gone to the back burner. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad that that happens, but it's also very understandable. I mean, if any of us look at the news cycle today, it's literally a 24 hour news cycle. Every day changes dramatically. As the trial nears, the local media, the national media will focus back on it and it will gain attention. Um, obviously the, the developments with Katie McBanawa and what may or may not have come from that certainly generated some interest back into the case. But, you know, I'm sitting here right now, it's nine years ago this night that, that something was about to happen. And I just think about the lives that were so dramatically changed on all sides of this, most obviously for the Markell family and for Dan's children as a result of, to me, petty jealousies. Mm. Uh, I'd be remiss, Tim Jansen, if I didn't say hi to Windsor in the background. Hey, Windsor. <laughs> I hope we are not boring him with this topic. He looks like he's more interested in squirrels out the window. But uh, Carl Steinbeck, <laughs> to you, uh, you sit in Texas. Um, that's where your law firm is. What got you interested in this? I think your brother John may have piqued your interest, but why did you get interested? And you've been doing a series uh, with us on 100, now close to 150 plus reasons why you believe Wendy Adelson, the ex uh, wife should be indicted in this case. Baby doll says, I hope on Dan's day tomorrow, that will be nine years that he was gunned down. Uh, we will be informed of an arrest or two. Uh, we'll see if that happens. It seems unlikely at this point, but uh, Carl to you, what got you interested uh, from uh, several mm -hmm. states away? Well, John is the one that introduced me to the case. I do follow a lot of uh, cases that you see on YouTube. I don't really watch a lot of them on TV, but like uh, 48 hours and 2020 shows like that. I, I do like watching crime uh, solving channels. And when John told me about this one, he, he said it was, you know, he mentioned that how many years it had been on, uh, been ongoing with uh, none of the Adelson's arrested. And I, I said, well, let me, let me see what kind of evidence they got out there on these folks. And what really was disturbing was the fact that the uh, Markels have not had justice all these years. And the fact that the two boys are with the uh, folks that planned the murder. And that was what was so dis disgusting to see. And just the way the case unfolded. And um, I, I think everybody on the prosecution side, law enforcement, does have the best interests at heart for the most part. I, I do question the, uh, the politician, uh, Mr. Meggs, that was leading the case and, and made some outrageous comments that were pro Adelson, which is just unheard of. I mean, you just don't hear a DA talking like that. So it just goes to show that you do have politics infesting 
different parts of the criminal arena, especially if you have a lot of money. And uh, I think a prosecutor should not look at that as anything, but you got to do justice. You got to find out what the truth is. And it's very easy to see that the truth was um, uh, the truth of how this crime started happened down there in the Miami area. And if you have the, you just got to figure out who hated Dan the most. And so it was very frustrating when I was looking at it to see the, all these wheels spinning of not um, targeting the Adelsons right away. I mean, it took them almost what, over two years to uh, actually do the bump. And they did get law enforcement from the FBI to uh, take part in that as well, which I think was a good move. But I, from what I've seen of all the uh, information, uh, including police reports and uh, testimonies that were presented on YouTube and how this case was uh, unfolding, I mean, it was just so obvious from, from the get-go the people that hated them the most were the Adelsons. And in fact, you had a, a wonderful witness I happen to know psychology as well. And I can tell you that criminal law has a lot of psychology involved in figuring out who done it, as well as being a good trial attorney. You really got to understand psychology of people, how to push their buttons, how to uncover motives, how to, uh, how to uh, basically expose uh, falsehoods in, in court and whatnot. So um, just, just the way this whole thing unfolded, um, I was frustrated also to see that you know, the uh, enhancement of the videotape for Charlie took so long. I mean, that was a three year delay right there. Mm. Um, don't understand that at all. But um, granted, they have other cases to pursue, but I don't know how many murders they have in Tallahassee. But this, a one, lot. This, <laughs> this one should not be on the back burner. And like I said, I think there's this Meg set off from from the get go uh, down the wrong tracks. And uh, the police were ready to go and make arrests of Adelson's from what I what I understand. But the, the prosecutor said no. And um, so finally, they did get the enhancement of the video with Charlie and the Dolce Vita talking to uh, Catherine. There's no doubt that they were involved in the murder. And so um, there is some progress may, being made on that. Hopefully we'll see more arrests. And that's expected based on the information. And I appreciate Preston Scott also sharing the sentiment that there is a lot of circumstantial evidence in this case. And you don't need to have you know, forensics or a confession. Um, other witnesses flipping on the Adelsons. Um, you got enough right there already. So this was a poorly planned murder. Um, they never, they never once stopped to think that is this the right thing to do to the two grandsons? But they went ahead and did it anyway. And there needs to be consequences for it. And so that, to me, is why it was really disgusting uh, when any of the, any of this kind of stuff goes on. It's just not this particular case. But I, I just have had a lifelong passion for injustice. And I had to see it being done. And so John asked me to sign up to uh, give some video on this. And that's how you guys reached out to me. So doing YouTubes and lives is not anything that I'm used to doing. And uh, but I, I'm willing to do it just just to make sure that uh, justice ultimately reigns and, and that people really know what the information is out there and how other attorneys size up information. And uh, granted, I'm not in Florida, but if this case was in Texas, I think it'd have a totally different um legacy and uh carl has been steadfast and he is a great <clears throat> mind and i highly encourage anyone who has not seen them to go back and check out a uh, hundred plus reasons why wendy adelson should be indicted carl has laid out uh point by point and we've had tim jansen and john singer another brilliant legal mind uh point kind of counterpointing them as we go uh susan Harmon, uh you know what got you pulled into this uh, vortex of Dan Markell. We'll get into the jailhouse calls in, in a moment, but uh, what got thank you interested? Um, thank you so much for asking and having me here. And um, so much respect to all of you for covering this case and taking the time out of your busy lives to kind of be a champion for Ruth Markell. And I just wanted to mention that it's almost the one year anniversary of the grandparents' rights bill being passed in on June 25th of last year and I just much like you all I saw this case on the over my dead body podcast and the 2020 and the dateline and I live in kind of near the Jacksonville Florida area and it's kind of smack dab between Tallahassee and Miami and I just kept seeing it on the news here and on YouTube and then also I just wanted to note myself being a uh, Jewish by heritage and by choice, it really stuck out to me the 
themes of kind of our modern day uh, struggles of, you know, modern um, reform Jews, Orthodox Jews, and the things that we go through, the choices that we have to make these days. And it really stuck out to me. And I'm also um, kind of close to Wendy Adelson's age, but I have to add that I am younger than Wendy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it kind of uh, fascinated me. And I have sort of a media background and I had some free time on my hands. So I volunteered for Mentor Lawyers channel. I was following his channel because at that time it was only the Over My Dead Body podcast and pretty much Mentor Lawyer and a few um, primetime TV specials. And I just offered to rewatch the trial and take notes for him and um, help him with some YouTube thumbnails. And then I just had a few more timelines and checklists of my own. So I just started my own channel. Very interesting. And uh, we extended an invite to Mentor Lawyer, one of the uh, OGs in the Dan Markell case. He's an attorney out of Tallahassee. He's on vacation this week and uh, could not make it. Uh, Raul Thomas, a friend of the show, imagine where Dan would be in his career at this stage. Uh, he had a ma an amazing uh, resume, an amazing CV, as they say in the law profession. Harvard undergrad, Harvard law professor at FSU with the sky the limit and uh, gunned down, uh, not even in the prime, I think before the prime of his career. Uh, Laura Werner with uh, a poignant comment, so sad for Dan's children who lost their father. Uh, I asked this fine panel, hey, is there anything specific you want to talk about? And John Steinbeck wrote back to me and said, um, are the Markells going to miss another of their grandchildren's uh, bar mitzvahs. They have two sons. Uh, they missed the first one. Uh, the second one is coming up. Um, John, does that sadden you, uh, give you a, a moment for pause uh, to realize how this family has been destroyed beyond just the murder of Dan? Yeah, I mean, it just again goes to show Wendy's heart. And then in my opinion, she doesn't truly love the boys because if she truly loved the boys, she put their interests first. I don't care how much you know hatred she had towards Dan during the last few years of marriage and then during the divorce, it's still their dad. And you know what? You, Wendy, you chose him to be their dad. So no matter what's going on between you and Dan, if you truly have love for these boys, you put them first. And you allow the Markells to see them as much as possible. And keep in mind, there was a six-year stretch where Ruth, Phil, and Shelly and the rest of the Markells were denied complete access to the boys. That is child abuse, in my opinion. And that's the reason I got into this case is because my book is, uh, is about parental alienation. And I follow a lot of cases, and this one just stood out to me. And it just screamed for injustice. It just screamed for justice because, I mean, these, these boys, all she had to do, if she really wanted to, to get out of this, is to say to Dan, hey, Dan, let's just move to Florida. And can I, can I have a plot where she divorces him down there where nobody's murdered? But instead... In my opinion, the whole gang got together, the Adelson Crime Syndicate, and plotted this. And the biggest sufferers today that are still alive, of course, are the boys. And that's why I raised that question to you. I, if, I, if I were a betting man, I'd bet my next paycheck that the Markells will not be invited to the bar mitzvah. And again, you'd think she'd even be concerned about looking good uh, in front of an upcoming trial. But that's, in my opinion, how much hatred that she and the rest of the Adelsons minus Robert have for uh, Dan Markell and the rest of his family. And uh, that's well put. And uh, it, it's, it's not, as you mentioned, it's not about uh, even Ruth at this point, uh, although it is, but it's, it's about these boys. I mean, they're being shut out from their own family and that goes, uh, it says something about uh, the Adelsons uh, approach to their own children and grandchildren uh, and what they're denying them in their own lives. Uh, Adam Go Knowles, probably humiliated by my St. Louis uh, question to Preston Go Knowles. Um, Preston, uh, you and Tim, I would say, uh, you know, you're, you're more uh, tied into this community than anyone else on this panel. Um, Carl brought up Willie Meggs. For those who are not familiar, can you take us back in time a little bit? Uh, who was Willie Meggs? How did he complicate the, the situation? And, and do you think he did? Tim? Um, I spoke to the investigator and um, they were very frustrated when it first began because they wanted to take Georgia Kappelman down to South Florida and they wanted to have 
they wanted to confront one of the shooters and they wanted to give him two minutes or five minutes with Georgia Kappelman, Georgia Kappelman would give him a life sentence and she could cut the deal right there if he flipped. Willie Meg says, no, just go down there and talk to him, see what happens. Willie's old school. And the agent told me, I'll tell you what happened. As soon as we left, he left. As soon as he left, he went to his lawyers. All, everybody started chatting. We never spoke to that guy again. We lost our momentum. We never had a chance to really do anything because he was in, he had lawyers and they couldn't do anything. So Willie was very conservative. Uh, that's Willie's nature. And Preston will tell you, my experience with Willie, he was a very old school lawyer, old school prosecutor, very conservative. But Tim, were there any ties between Willie and the Adelson family uh, politically? I don't. I don't know of any. Willie's from pretty much here. Um, I wouldn't see him running in those circles. Um, he wasn't a big. F he didn't like FSU sports. He hated the players. When I represented <laughs> Jameis, he didn't like them. We had our own standoff with that. But Willie, he made his decision. He focused what he thought was right and wrong. And uh, you weren't going to budge him. And he was here so long that the law enforcement agencies kind of kowtowed to him. You know, the one thing I would add to this, and and obviously I've, I've known Willie on a personal level, not as friends or anything, but, you, you know, Tim will tell you, Tallahassee is not a city. It's a big town. <laughs> and you just you run in circles and you know people and you get to know them a little bit. I don't believe this was a political thing for Willie at all. Um, and while I think there was plenty of evidence, as uh, Carl, you know, illuminated very well, I think that in the grand scheme of things, his his decision to wait might, in fact, end up being a stronger case when it's all said and done, because they do have the enhanced video. They do have Katie McBanawa now in a situation where she apparently approached and wanted to say something. And so... Right, wrong, or indifferent, they waited. We can't do anything about that. But I personally don't think uh, – I agree with Tim. I don't. I just don't see Willie having any ties or circles down there where the Adelson money or influence would have had any, any role in the decision one way or the other. I think he believed from the very beginning that the family was involved, but they needed a very strong case to go up that chain, and I personally think they, they have it. Hmm. Well, uh, Katie Meg Bonawa is not going to be a witness in this trial. You mark Tim, my words. Tim, what happened with this proffer? And then for those who don't know, Katie Meg Bonawa was the, the middle woman between the Adelsons and the hitmen. She helped uh, orchestrate it. She was given immunity twice and could have been spared uh, prison time. She's now serving life. Um what, what do you think was going on behind the scenes with this proffer? She was going to offer a proffer. Uh, it was highly anticipated for a while and then just fizzled out. But what, at the end of the day, do you think happened to him? Well, I talked to people in the know. I'm not going to name anybody. Very uneventful. She didn't even have a lawyer at the proffer, which tells you she was basically just sitting there. Um, and nothing came of it. And nothing is going to come of it. They're not going to call her as a witness. It'd be a bad distraction. It would only help Charlie's case to have Katie, who went to trial twice, who testified twice, who got convicted murderer, and now they're calling her. It'd be it'd be horrible for the state, and it would and confuse the jury. Preston, are you surprised that uh, Charlie Adelson did not uh, reach out to Tim Jansen? Uh, instead, he went to Daniel Rashbaum in Miami. Is that uh, going to be a fatal? flaw not hiring a man that knows Tallahassee knows the system and is one of the finest criminal defense attorneys there is but especially in the Tallahassee area I don't know Tim would you have wanted a case like this <laughs> you know I did the Brian Winchester case how do you think he affords that mahogany behind yeah. him Preston? <laughs> this is a this is something I would have to discuss with the family with my wife and with my partner um Although, you know, we can't pick and choose the cases we because we, we we defend people. We believe they have a right to trial. But this would be one I would have to really soul search. Uh, John, 
uh, the grandparents' rights bill was brought up um, by Susan. And uh, for those who don't know, Ruth Markell championed this. Um, she's been not been denied grandparents' rights. Um, how big a legacy is that, that she was able to get this law passed in the state of Florida, uh, get some movement uh, going forward and give grandparents a modicum of hope if they find themselves in this or a similar situation where they're denied visitation? Yeah, you know, it's a credit to her and to Karen Cyphers, I believe her name is, is for doing this yeah. together. And I mean, I'm thinking down the road, 10, 15, 20 years, the Markel boys will know that this Markel Act was done because of Ruth and the rest of the Markels. Um, so long-term thinking like that, I think it's great. Short-term, it's, it's a little bit limited, so it's not just a blanket. Um, you have to have two reasons, very defined reasons for that to happen. But it also, I don't know, also it shows really how bad, not just in Florida, but around the states, so how grandparent rights, they're slowly coming through, but they're very limited. And it says a lot, the fact that it takes someone from Canada to come into a state and get this change. I mean, it should be automatic that grandparents get access to their grandkids, but unfortunately, Family courts around the states are very behind the times when it comes to that. So, yeah, I think it's a real, real big credit to Ruth and again, Karen Cyphers for getting this done. And uh, who knows, maybe in this case, it will help going forward. That's too early to tell yet. But <coughs> someone pointed out that I have a halo. No, this is not our new set. I am uh, coming to you from Los Angeles. Uh, my wife thought it'd be a great idea to come to LA before going to Europe for some reason. We had a wedding here. And, uh, for full disclosure, uh, it was a great party last night. Too good. Um, so I'm hurting a little bit today, but uh, I feel, you know, it's a good vibe. It's a, it's a solemn vibe, um, as it should be today. Um, Susan, to you, um, what have you discovered? What's kind of the, the, the primary takeaway? I know you've been looking at these jailhouse phone yes. calls from Charlie Adelson. What would you say is the primary takeaway from the calls you've listened to? And then maybe we can get into some of the more specific ones as we move forward. Uh, if we're talking about the the jail the jail rat house records, um, I I wanted to note something that kind of jumped out at me recently was that right after the April 29th, uh, 2022 wiretap hearing where they tried to deny the enhanced uh, Dolce Vita video with the uh, with the subtitles, especially tried to um, did not allow that in the in the trial after Katie's trial. But right after the wiretap hearing, Charlie's counsel had withdrawn. And I had to look back at my notes to remember that it wasn't Charlie who actually fired his counsel. They withdrew after uh, about 15 days after the wiretap hearing about the Dolce Vita uh, enha newly enhanced video. So that's something that has jumped out to me about almost a year later. But especially with the uh, following these jailhouse records, um, last year, right around the, um, uh, after that, I had noticed that Charlie was being checked a lot. He was in protective custody, as Daniel Rashbaum called it. My client is in protective custody. It's not a blank watch. And I think we're supposed to, as according to the uh, Jacksonville newspaper today, we're supposed to call it unalive uh, instead of the word that I had used last year. So uh, I believe that he was on an unalive watch because he was being checked about 24 times a day. Now it's up to about 50 times a day. And I did in fact find, uh, and that was back in April 2nd of um Let's see. Now I've found on April 2nd of 2023, Charlie is in fact on a unalive watch. And that's the most interesting thing that I've found recently. Did, did you say he's being checked on how many times a day? About 55. And, and that's by guards doing their rounds. Is that right? Uh, yes. These are just called the daily incident reports or event logs. And I was pretty astounded. I, I could not believe uh, that in the beginning when Charlie was in protective custody that he was being checked at least on the hour. And to me, that was a lot. And I think that a lot of people had said, well, it's just 
that's common routine and I, I definitely do agree, but uh, there have definitely been, it was in black and white recently that I saw that there was a blank watch on April 2nd. And among other things, Charlie has had two, two events. Uh, and actually my mom uncovered that I had said, what does this E2 mean? And it's actually uh, the second event uh, of in, uh, his disciplinary, it was um, not actual official disciplinary action. It's like a minor disciplinary action. His first event was on October 5th of 20, uh, 22. He did not make his bed. So that was his first incident. And then he, the second incident was uh, this latest incident um, on, let's see, on June 30th of 2023, where he was actually with three other men and refused to leave the day room. So that was his E2, his second event. And I actually wanted to uh, mention to Carl, I watched one of your videos and you thought that Charlie might need to join a gang. And according to this incident, he was kind of standing his ground with two other men. So kind of being a badass in the day room. <laughs> so maybe he is in a gang now. <coughs> Carl, what do you make of this behavior, if anything? I mean, one is very minor, not making your bed, which I probably get tagged for. Um, and I might go in the same category in some ways as Charlie Adelson as a spoiled young Jewish man, uh, <laughs> not to cast aspersions on him. But uh, what do you make of these? What, 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 I mean, what do you make of this? The fact that he wanted to hold his ground in the day room. Do you read anything into that? Well, I think... I think he's going to have a much easier time uh, being in a jail. The jail is a much more transient type of environment, and he's having uh, no gangs that are going to be uh, shaking him down for money. And so once he goes to prison, it's going to be a whole different story, and uh, he's going to be looking at Aryan Nation. I mean, I've, I've never seen a rich Jewish person go to prison before that, that I, a case I was involved in or, or, or knew of. So um, this is... Uh, going to be something that he's going to be facing uh, threats every every hour of his waking life. And he may succumb. I, I think he's also on a lot of meds. I know, um, Susan, you mentioned he was on different medications. And uh, a lot of times these medications can actually cause people to want to end their life. So hopefully that's not the outcome. But uh, just the fact that he's not fitting in the culture with all the folks that are in the prison there, and there's a lot of violent folks there. There's there's lifers there. He's not going to really encounter the kind of hardened criminal lifers that, that he does in the county jail. And so um, when when they know they're in state prison and they're not getting out and there's all kinds of cultures and turf wars among the gangs and he's not going to be fitting in easily because he sticks out like a sore thumb having all that money from the Adelsons. And so that's why John and I did a video recently talk about uh, basically, they're going to have an endless supply of extortions trying to get money out of him. And the question is, they're never going to think he's he's completely broke. So they're going to keep going after him. So I, I think I think there is a potential that he just becomes overwhelmed and, and just doesn't want to live anymore. And um, I, I think right now he still has hope that, you know, he's going to be able to uh, bamboozle a jury and, and be a walk out of prison, be a free man. But uh, that's uh, that's that's pretty much guaranteed not to happen. So. Um, he is he is going to he's going to have a newfound uh, survival, uh, like I say, at his doorstep once once he gets sent, transferred to the state prison system. And lawyers don't like to use uh, the term slam dunk case. But Carl Steinbeck implying this is as close as it's going to get. Uh, Preston, for you from Harold, anything but dull, a friend of the show. Uh, you once said you believed uh, Wendy Adelson had plausible deniability. Do you still think so? You served on a grand jury in the county. I really respect your opinion. Tim has great hair. I had to get thrown in there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we can all agree Tim has great hair. Um, yeah, you know, I think Wendy's deniability is, is getting more and more uh, implausible. I think there was a time that she had some, although I, I don't think that, just because I think that she had the most, uh, the best bubble around her as this case unfolded. 
but I think it's being diminished. I think that the, the video enhancement, I think the code talk, I think all of that just starts to become, it's just, it becomes less and less plausible deniability to me. But um, yeah, for a while, I thought she had some. Mm. Uh, Susanna Steinbeck. Uh, she's giving it away with her last name. So excited Carl and John are on this chat. Uh, sister, wife, John? It's my daughter. She's in Germany right now. I told her about it, but I assumed she'd be in bed, not watching it, but I guess she is. Susanna, welcome, welcome. Uh, you have a cool dad. Uh, you should be proud of your cool dad. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of his. And uh, spread the word in Germany. We are a global show. Uh, Preston, let me ask you about that, by the way. We have viewers here, Preston, from... Uh, Australia, Germany, as you see. Why the global interest in this case, Preston? I think everybody on this uh, panel probably can explain that. There's just, there's, there's always going to be an intrinsic desire for justice, period, end. I think that's in all of us. I think if you're a human being, when you see something that you feel intuitively is just wrong, um, you know, I, I wrote down a note earlier. Um, why didn't they think of what would be best for the boys? I think, Carl, what scares me the most is they did. They thought this is what was best for the boys to kill their father. And that's what horrifies me. And I think, uh, Joel, that's what resonates to people. These kinds of cases where you've got so many different levels of victims, because there are, and, and I think that people are drawn to these cases and people want to see justice served. And you all just pointed out, this is an unusual situation where a wealthy businessman who happens to be white, happens to be Jewish, is facing life in prison, if not capital punishment, um, yeah, that's a pretty unusual case. And I think that in and of itself draws attention. Uh, John, back to you. Uh, sensory combustion, who's also a friend of the show, Dan's poor children brainwashed. Um, do you think Wendy and Don are doing everything they can to, in fact, you know, loosely to use that phrase or term brainwash are doing that? I think they're speaking ill of uh, their, you know, deceased father uh, trying to, paint the picture that they want portrayed? Yeah, I think you nailed it. I think absolutely they're trying to, I think first and foremost, make themselves a victim as in don't listen to what's on YouTube and the media because here's what really happened. And in my, in my gut, I think that they just laid out a bunch of lies to make themselves victims. And then they're a victim all the way through in all this and that the boys should feel sorry for them. I think that fits perfectly with their type of uh, personality disorders from the puppet, puppet master, Donna, down to Wendy. And just remember this, all it took, all it would have taken is for one of the Adelsons to stand up and say, you know, this is not a good idea. Harvey, why didn't Harvey stand up and say, hey, guys, I, I get your hatred for him and I get you want the kids down into uh, so South Florida along with Wendy, but let's not go all the way through murder. Charlie could have said no. Winnie could have stopped this dead in its tracks. So that's why it's just also such a compelling story when we talk about why we find this. How many MDs, doctors, pilots, lawyers are in jail right now facing murder? I mean, it just doesn't happen. And then you think these people should love these boys. And in my opinion, they don't because, in fact, I think that their vitriol, their hatred towards Dan exceeds that of their love of their boys. That's the bottom line here is they hate they hated Dan more than they loved their boys and that's why we're in this position today. Mm. Harsh but uh very very possibly true. Uh Tim Jansen, uh we are expecting we're going to get to the trial in a couple of minutes but we're expecting a case management hearing in August. Walk us through that. What goes on? How long does that last? I know uh Corey Richens had a very uh she's the Utah mom accused of poisoning her husband some kind of bail hearing and it ended up going a uh, four and a half hours turned into a mini trial. Uh, I talked to attorneys there said they'd never seen a hearing like that go more than 15 minutes. So uh, with a high profile nature of this case, what are we expecting at a case hearing? Well, the case management is not like the pretrial docket. 
that's got more evidentiary issues. Case management's going to be like, okay, where are we? We're, it's basically a, a, just a docket entry to keep it moving forward. Some issues could come up, but the, when you get to the pretrial, and that'll be right after this, and then the docket sounding, that's when the issues are going to be a little more complicated. You should know um, whether or not um, the case is going to move forward. Um, so everybody knows I on, on when I think it was Thursday last week, I attended the funeral of uh, Judge Hankinson. Uh, Hankinson was there. Uh, you know, he, he went over the he did the trial, the first couple trials. And for uh, those who don't know him, uh, just uh, let the audience know about him. Which uh, Hankinson was a, a career prosecutor uh, for the state. He worked with me at the feds for a while. Uh, and then he became a judge. He's been on the bench probably about 20 something years. He was a no nonsense judge. He was a very bright judge. He was chief of criminal judge. All the judges looked to him. Um, there was no nonsense in his courtroom. Um, he was very seldom overturned. Uh, law enforcement was all there. All the judges were there. Um, the FBI agent on this case was there. The prosecutor in this case was there. Uh, everybody was there for his funeral. Um, he would not take any nonsense from out of town lawyers. As you can see, uh, the first trial, I think, and Meg Bonawa's first trial, he took no nonsense from the lawyers in Miami who tried to play games. Um, the new judge, Judge Wheeler, he's not as strict probably as Hankinson, but he's polite enough to him. And I think the new lawyer is going to be a lot more clever than the other lawyers. Um, he's getting along with the prosecutors. Mm. A very quick programming note, uh, two for one this Monday. And then I promise I am going on vacation. We'll still be giving you content every day, but, uh, 8 PM Eastern time, which is an hour and 15 minutes away. I believe we will be doing a live with an amazing panel on the long Island serial killer, the accused serial killer, Rex Hewerman. Uh, we've got Carrie Rawson, the daughter of uh, infamous BTK serial killer, the legend, Dr. Ann Burgess, uh, the show, uh, Mindhunter on Netflix is loosely based off of her work. Uh, Greg McCrary literally wrote the manual on serial killers for the FBI, entering the FBI in 1969. And Joe Jackalone, who uh, is NYPD and has been covering the case from the beginning. And look at this, as if uh, five was not enough. We now add Judy Tsang. Judy, can you hear us? Hi, Judy. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Judy. Hello. Hello. Judy, let's throw you right into the mix. You're coming in late. What got you interested uh, in this case? Judy hosts Asian American Legal Focus. Uh, she's been on it on YouTube. She just uh, had my man, Steve Cohen, our uh, excellent booking producer, join her show to read a part. But Judy, what really got you uh, interested in covering this case? Um, well, it was mainly because I really identified with Wendy as well as Dan as someone who was married to a law professor and also had to move to North Carolina because of his job. So, of course, I, I felt sort of just like Wendy, kind of resentful and feeling like I got dragged along to some smaller town where I wasn't really happy and my career took a nosedive. And so that, that was one reason why the case was so compelling to me. Yeah, but Judy, you never uh, thought, uh, let me let me get rid of my husband. That thought never crossed your mind, I hope. No, not at all, because I acknowledge that he's a good father and my son definitely needs him in his mm -hmm. life. You know, the thought of killing him off never crossed my mind. Nor did it come across my parents' minds either. <laughs> and, and that's why Judy is a rational human being. Mm -hmm. Carl Steinbeck, look at these comments here. Johnny Supertramp, nine years. I don't see an indictment unless someone flips, followed by tornado artist uh, Carl, who says, you've inspired me, Carl. I have a notebook. I've been taking notes for your list for the past two weeks, watching both trials. Uh, you are inspiring the next generation, Carl Steinbeck. Of your list of uh, 100 plus reasons to indict Wendy Adelson, um, what are the kind of the core three, two or three that you would uh, start with um, in your opening uh, statements, you know, uh, if you were presenting this case? Yeah, if I could uh, just address that one uh, first comment first um, about having uh, 
any of the other Adelsons flip, that that's going to uh, cause an indictment to happen. I mean, you don't in you don't you're not going to get a flip unless you do indict someone. So that's sort of like waiting for something to happen that you're not willing to take initiation to get the train down the track. So, and, and Carl, uh, do you do you agree with that? Do you think other indictments are coming down the down the pike? I. I can't imagine that they wouldn't. So I don't know why they would sit back and just say we, we're we got Charlie and we're done solving the crime and uh, we're 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 going on to other crimes. And so this one is unsolved. They've done um, they've gotten a number of convictions so far. The Adelsons <clears throat> uh, planned this out. Where they was able to string justice along for a while. The wheels of justice moved slowly, and they got some some kinks in the cog, but. Uh, the, the kinks are getting worked out, and uh, the new the new prosecutor that replaced Megs, he uh, at least allowed them to prosecute Charlie now, and uh, they're going to have a good outcome for that. So, um, if they need to have building up momentum that way and confidence, then 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 so be it. Um, but but to say that they're not no more indictments after this means they they basically the rest of them got away with it. So uh, the family was very tightly woven. They were all up in Wendy's business and what was going on there in Tallahassee. And there's several key factors that of just one, I think, if you're an experienced uh, criminal lawyer or prosecutor or law enforcement detective or whatnot, the evidence just jumps out in a way that maybe somebody that watching TV shows and hasn't actually been in the courtroom trying cases like these. So it's sort of like you you, you can s smell it right away. Um, and this one, the, the things that really stood out to me was the um the fact that wendy was uh you know in on part of the uh the code word for the tv the fact that she kept on talking about her brother putting out it you know was looking into hiring a hitman the year before that actual hitman uh and men actually took out <clears throat> Dan. and uh, there was also the fact that she was telling things and acting weird with jeff lacoste and asking <laughs> where he was going to be at on that particular friday there's just too many indicators that she knew the hit was about to go down the way she avoided Dan that week, the way she faked laryngitis and couldn't talk to him. And yet she's talking to everybody else, including a lot of other people that morning. And there's a lot of other little clues as well. The little clues feed into the big, big nuggets of, of uh, indicators of guilt. And those are even the fact that she wouldn't, you know, call Dan back that morning, the day, the morning he got shot until after she expected him to be uh, taken out that morning, which, um, I, I thought was very uh, timely as well to show that uh, she didn't expect him to answer the phone. And sure enough, he didn't because he had already been uh, had two bullets to the head. So it's it just it's just so sick and disgusting. And um, and then the other thing what um, we've talked about before is I look at when I'm prosecuting a case or even if I'm looking to defend a case, I want to I want to know the truth in my mind as much, much as possibly I can. And um, I look at the behavior of all the parties before, during, and after the day of the serious incident. So if, if you look at how Wendy acted beforehand, also the fact that she had uh, so much to lose with Dan's pending motion, where he was going, he, she basically at least was going to lose her job with the FSU law. <coughs> at least it was reasonable in her mind to believe that. And so the urgency of the hit became apparent. They also, the hitman also knew that Dan was leaving town that uh, following day that it had to be done now. They had also, um, Sigfredo Lisa had driven up there in June, early June, the month prior to the hit in July and uh, tried to find Dan to kill him at that time, but it wasn't successful. So the Adelsons were really desperate to get this mission taken care of and they eventually uh, were successful, but it was a very, uh, very poorly planned murder because they, they left so many uh, things undone. And the way they acted afterwards, too, the way they've treated the boys, they changed the middle name of the one that had the connection to the uh, the Markels. You just go on and down on down the road to how they acted once uh, the two hitmen were arrested and all of a sudden things are off where all of a sudden the uh, the uh, bar mitzvah and what the visitations weren't going to happen. And uh, or maybe maybe I'm maybe mixing that up with Charlie's arrest. So what's Charlie's arrest got to do with, you know, them attending a bar mitzvah? So it's for the boys. But I think they're so concerned about the boys finding out information that that's why they're, um, you know, limiting them from social media, 
the boys are trying to they're trying to have them live in a bubble. Well, eventually, one of these days, the boys are going to bust out of that bubble, and it's going to be a rude awakening for the Adelsons. So maybe it'll maybe it'll be the day that you know Donna and and Wendy are arrested, uh, in, in the near very near future. Or so, but but mark my words, they are going to find out the truth here in the very near future because they'll be old enough to digest the facts and and look at it and, and just think, gee, you know what? We never did hear them say a good word about Dan our whole lives. Right. Something like that will resonate with the boys. Gee, why wasn't grandma and grandpa and any other Markels here visiting me and participating in the celebration of my bar mitzvah? Gee, why didn't I ever get to go see my dad's grave up in Canada? Gee, why didn't I ever get to go to Canada to see all my whole family tree of the Markels there? I mean, I could go on and on. There's so many facts that just show they don't care about the boys. They don't think they have to answer for what they did. But they will have to answer at some point. I, I, I'm very convinced of that here in the near future. Uh, Chloe Costas, Carl Steinbeck is a brilliant strategic legal mind. I love his YouTube, cha YouTube channel with his brother. John also has a great channel. Uh, Carl's list here from Roxanne, hands down, phenomenal. Um, Preston, are you um, hopeful that there will be other indictments uh, coming, uh, coming the Markel's way? Oh, good Lord, yes. Yeah. there, And in my opinion, I agree with Carl, you know, everything he just laid out and probably then some um, there, there's so much that points to Donna really being the, the real maestro uh, with all due respect to Charlie's license plate. Um, but I want to bring up another set of kids and I got to go in a few minutes cause I'm getting up in a few hours to do my radio show, but I would, I would love to hear everybody's take on a theory that I've been holding on to. And when we talked about it before, Joel, with uh, another attorney, he didn't necessarily share the opinion, but I keep going back to why Katie has not flipped. And the only reason that I can think of is her children. There has to be something involved with the Adelsons in providing something to her children through all of this that has bought her silence because their dad is in prison for the rest of his life. Mom is in prison for the rest of her life. And the only thing that I can even conceive that would cause someone to not just go ahead and present evidence is the welfare of their children. And I, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. And so with that, I'm going to leave you all with that question. And I'd love to hear your answers. Uh, Preston, uh, great to have you. For those who don't know, he's the host of the morning show with Preston Scott in Tallahassee. He's lived in Tallahassee since 1987, and he hosts the uh, Preston Scott show, which he's getting up for since 2002. And his father, by the way, he called the first Super Bowl. Preston, I always screw that up. Yeah, he called the first couple of Super Bowls and the first few for CBS television, yes. That's a, that's a legend right there, and uh, that is an FSU hat, not a St. Louis Cardinals hat. My bad. And, uh, Preston, we're going to discuss this. Uh, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you being it's here. My pleasure. Thank you all very much. Thanks. See you, Preston. Um, Judy, uh, what do you make of Preston's um, you know, assertion there that uh, Katie is uh, basically getting paid off, and that's why um, – and in more crew terms than he put it, is getting paid off by the Adelsons perhaps. And that's why she didn't um, flip or didn't bring forth a proffer. Uh, do you believe that to be the case potentially? Well, first I, I thought she did flip. It's just that we don't know what she actually said. So I think it's kind of premature to say, well, she didn't flip on them. I don't know. <laughs> but but I, I do think that it's pretty unlikely that – Adelsons are funneling money to her kids. And the reason I think that is because her younger brother, no, I think it's an older brother, but the second brother has actually been sued twice for foreclosure for failing to pay his HOA dues. So if he's so flush in cash and all this money is coming from the Adelson family, I think it's kind of weird that he would be sued for non-payment of his dues. That's just um, my guess. Yeah. Um, Tim, I'm curious. Uh, 
Judy just, you know, basically alluded to the fact that maybe Katie did did flip, but you you think that's not the case. Uh, are you in disagreement with Judy over this? I'm going to be the negative on everything. <laughs> and I say that with some information on the inside that I can't divulge. Mm. But in, in order to prosecute Wendy, they have to have evidence, not moral evidence, legal evidence. She has deniability. They could have done it without her knowledge. But I agree with a lot with what Carl said. I don't believe Wendy will ever be charged. Donna is probably got a better chance of being charged than Wendy because Donna's on the tapes. Donna paid the money. Donna's communicating with Charlie, clearly culpable. Um, the agents believed at first that the family was paying off Meg Bonawa. And they went to her again and again. Then the agents thought that they had threatened to kill the kids, her kids. Um, so they went from they're getting paid to they were afraid something was going to happen to her kids. Uh, Meg Donna was proper, was nothing to speak about. Um, I'm surprised Rossbaum doesn't want it to come out. But the question is, has Rossbaum even seen it? Because if you're not going to turn over, um, if you don't list her as a witness, and unless it's exculpatory, you don't have to turn it over. If you're going to use her as a witness, then you got to turn it over. I'd be curious to see if Rashbaum even has seen the proper. Because what I've heard from is nothing. So why did he file the motion to keep it sealed? Uh, maybe some tactics there. But in talking to him, I don't think they believe they have enough to indict Wendy. And I don't think anything in Charlie's trial is going to give him any more. Uh, the, the prosecutor's up for election next year. Uh, and it's pretty well known that the progressive arms are going to try to run someone against Jack. Jack's not a left. He's a prosecutor. He prosecutes cases. So he's not friend on the left, left progressive side. And they're trying to find, they're actively trying to find someone to run against him. Mm -hmm. So I don't see Jack taking a chance of losing a case right before he gets elected. Carl, does it hurt to hear Tim say that he flat out does not think Wendy is getting indicted? Does it bug you? Um, just a messenger. I'm not, <laughs> not well, my he, but but Tim's also agreed there's enough evidence to indict and convict her. So I mean that's basically telling you that they're weak there in Tennessee or excuse me Tallahassee on uh, on murder cases like this. So so it is frustrating to to hear that. But I I'm still being optimistic that justice will happen and. Uh, in which order they prosecute them, I think it'd make the most sense to prosecute both of them. Because here's the thing, if you know that they're guilty, why wouldn't you prosecute them? The evidence is there, and you'll never know for sure um, unless you actually try the case. So if you're only going to try a case where you feel like you have a slam dunk, then I, I think you're missing your mark as a prosecutor. You're, you're called to try the tough cases when you know you're doing the right thing. You should never be trying to railroad somebody, right, as, as a prosecutor. But when you have... The cards in your hand as a prosecutor, you don't as a defense attorney, but as a prosecutor, you have the cards in your hand. And when you know a murder happened, you should be going after everybody that was involved. And you should be trying to formulate the best evidence you can. And unless you charge people and indict them, and there'd be no way that you couldn't get these folks indicted, that uh, maybe not for Harvey, but that would develop in time. But um, in any event, until you start charging them, they're not going to flip. So it just doesn't work that way. So they won't get the information on uh, the Adelsons flipping among themselves unless they charge them. So I, I think it's uh, very much um, negligence if they don't do that. And I think it's a, it's a it's, it's actually very sad for the boys to, to know that they won't have justice for what was done to their dad if, if they never go after all the parties. Carl, I think they don't know the facts like you do. OK, well, I talked to a couple of them and I talked about this. They don't even know that this uh, podcast exists. So they're not listening. Shame to on them. Shame on them. But Roshbaum knows it exists and he listens to it every time it's on. When I was talking to the people who are being involved in this, they don't even know this exists. Well, George is watched. I know that. And but, George has uh, got a lot of cases. Many she's not focusing just on this one. 
I mean, it's no excuse. I agree. They can be indicted. But my understanding is they they don't believe they have enough. SGS Nation, let's get the word out. Let's let the uh, powers that be uh, in Tallahassee know about our show. Send them links. Tweet them links. Do your thing. Um, Judy, do you wonder if uh, Daniel Rashbrown, that is Charlie Adelson's attorney, is he trying to talk some sense into Charlie? You're an attorney. What's going on behind the scenes right now uh, during those conversations? And then we'll go go to Susan, who's been monitoring some of the calls. So we'll we'll get the the, the lowdown. Uh, but, but what do you think should be going on, Judy? Well, based on what Tim said on a previous show, I thought that Rashbaum thought he had a great defense. So maybe they're all in it thinking that they're going to win at trial, in which case there's not much of Rashbaum trying to talk some sense into Charlie if they think they have a great defense, mm -hmm. which uh, I think I'm again, I'm just guessing. I would think that they would point the fingers at Wendy. He wasn't going to admit to me that he thought he had a bad defense. Yeah. yeah. He's puff, puff, puff. There's certain puffery going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Susan, do you? And now I'm getting a little reverb here. I don't know why. Oh, yes. Um, I, I definitely have some tea to spill for you guys about Charlie's uh, July 4th. Guys, if you can do me a favor, just everyone mute themselves oh, um, okay. except, for, except for Susan. Okay. I definitely have some news about the July 4th phone calls. And maybe uh, to piggyback on a question for all of the lawyers on this chat, um, I definitely was suspicious whether Charlie and Daniel Rashbaum were speaking on July 4th. And the next video I'm working on, probably going to record after this phone call, uh, this Zoom or StreamYard, I'm, uh, I saw that Daniel Rashbaum and Charlie were, were talking all day on July 4th. And I wanted to ask all of you, how common is that to speak to your clients on a national holiday when you're spending time with your family and friends? Is that something that's normal? I wouldn't say it's normal, but I, uh, depending on his trial schedule, he probably was free the whole day, which could have cleared up time for him to talk to him and, Maybe they're doing some soul searching. Who knows? Um, all day. That's a lot. How many? Eight well, hours you spoke to I need to look at my notes. I need to look at my notes, but I definitely decided that they are bros because if you're calling someone on July 4th, you definitely care about them a little bit. And uh, I also wanted to note that um, there is zero evidence that Wendy has spoken to Charlie in jail and definitely a huge no-no to talk to your co-conspirators, but that definitely didn't stop Donna and Harvey from talking to Charlie. They were chatting on July 4th as well. And along with allegedly some of Charlie's former flames, and I'll go into that in the next video, but um, I just wanted to also mention that I'm really excited, uh, just anxiously awaiting uh, what motions are going to be put forward in the um, next case management hearing, because I think that those motions might kind of shed some light on whether Katie has been truthful in the proper or whether the state believes that she is being truthful. So I think if we see something like uh, to question Katie's credibility or her character evidence, I think that we might assume that the state believes that she is telling the truth and or something like we've seen from uh, from uh, when uh, Louis Rivera was a was a state witness. Uh, we're not supposed to question his uh, his credibility or his prior crime and gang affiliation. So do you guys think that there will be some interesting motions put forward? Uh, Carl, you want to take that? Well, on a case where the, your client's charged with murder, there's going to be a, a lot of motions. A lot of them are going to be rudimentary type motions that are filed. And uh, so those uh, a lot of those will probably be stock motions that he's filed in other cases before. And so what particular ones he brings up in this case um, remains to be seen. But I would say also going back to your point about eight hours talking to Charlie, I think that is very unusual um, but I think it, it is maybe a sign that maybe, maybe they're having a serious conversation about him flipping on the other Adelson. So, 
Um, that seems an unduly long time to spend a federal holiday because I think Rashbaum has a family and, and kids as well. So why why you'd be taking eight hours oh, of their time? Away. It wasn't actually eight hours. It was just he was talking to about five different people from about nine in the morning till about 11 p.m. at night. But I'll get that information to you okay. all soon. Yeah, and I'll connect you guys. You can share that. Uh, yeah. As John gets his cough out of the way here, uh, Jacelyn, 1984, in my opinion, uh, John, Wendy is the original driving force. She's daddy's little girl. She was unhappy. Mommy's little girl, too. And she got her dad and especially her mom to get a murder plan started. Uh, John, do you see it that way? You're not an attorney, by the way, John, but uh, a rational mind with a much harder job. I uh, won't mention what it is on air today, but uh, what do you make of this comment? That very well could be, but I'm more towards leaning that the real puppet master in this is her mom. And at the very least, I think that her mom poured the gasoline on the fire. Because if you read her emails, you can see that there's a lot of fire in her in her stomach against Dan and including all the, you know the Hitler comments and stuff like that. That that's not something Wendy would say. So I mean that could be. We don't really know. We're just speculating here. But um I believe if um, if I could make a, a gambling bet, I would believe that uh, it was when, it was actually her mom, because then remember how close she is to Charlie, right? So I'm sure she talked to Charlie and said, "Look, here's what we need to do," and just crack the whip at Wendy. That's my belief. Mm. Uh, Raul Thomas, we could send Donna a Queen Maestro T-shirt, then they'll know that's uh, in response to what uh, Preston Scott had to say. Uh, by the way, guys, it made me nervous. I just got bounced out of this uh, chat for a moment, and I'm back. So if I bounce out again, I'm in. Uh, I'm not in the regular home studio. I'm in a studio in Los Angeles. Uh, so if you see me disappear, hopefully I will be uh, right back in the room if it happens again. Um, Carl and John brought up another very interesting angle. Um, Carl, I'll bring it to you. <laughs> Um, you guys did a podcast, uh, which I did not see for full disclosure, uh, with an extortion angle, basically saying that now the Adelsons are incredibly vulnerable uh, toward a, uh, extortion attempts for the rest of their lives. Can you elaborate, Carl, what you mean by that? Well, I mentioned it earlier in the show, but I, I can expand. Charlie is such a unique individual to be prosecuted and when he's sentenced to the florida penal system you're talking about him being around a lot of very violent people i mean what he did was a violent act but we're talking about hardened very hardened criminals and they won't hesitate to slit your throat stab you in the back in fact that uh molester doctor from the olympics uh olympians uh that molested all those girls up in uh michigan he was just recently stabbed in a Florida prison. So uh, for Charlie to have all the money and the family connections with money um, being in a prison, he's looking at a very different type of threat environment. And so he's going to have, uh, you know, people fighting over his money and he's going to be caught in the middle. He's not going to know who, which side to take. And if he thinks he's able to stand tough in a jail cell, well, when you're talking about Aryan Nation and some of the real violent gangs that are down there, um, he, he, I, it's, it's going to be so ugly for him. And the other, the other point we made was that if you, if you see how easy it was to uh, put a bump out on where Don and Harvey live, you can Google that and see where they live. So, I mean, all it takes is the uh, criminal gangs to find out where they live. And they could do their own bump on Charlie or Donna or Wendy and say, cough up the money or Charlie's dead next week. We want to interject something, something, yep. some tea that I know. So Charlie was actually threatened on August 31st of uh, 2023. And no, sorry, of 2022. Sorry. He uh, there was an incident where his iPad was stolen, the iPad that he's been looking at all of the case documents. And so he actually snitched on one of his jail mates and this jail mate actually threatened his life and his family's life. So I think I had talked about that in uh, 
Charlie getting bullied video. And then there was actually another uh, bullying incident on December 16th of somebody spitting at him or making either spitting noises or kissing noises. I'm not really sure, but um, as it had stood last year, he was kind of getting bullied. And now it seems like maybe he will have to join a gang because people are threatening his family. It was in his incident reports. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Angela, I knew Tim would love this comment. Tim is a Debbie Downer. So, so much for the good hair. Uh, Tim is a Debbie Downer. Uh, Tim is just, uh, as he says, don't shoot the messenger. Um, but Tim, to you, uh, this trial, I believe the, the trial date is set for October 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, what can we expect to see? How long is jury selection go in a place like Tallahassee? How long will this trial last? How many witnesses will be called? Uh, peer into that crystal ball of yours, Tim Jansen, and let us know how this is going to play out. And then, Judy, love to get your response to what Tim has to say here. Well, I would think at the pretrial or the um, docket sounding, that's when a judge will say and set the how many days. State will say how many, how long they think it'll take, probably a couple of weeks. The defense, if they put a, present, present a case, which I think they probably will, uh, I'd be curious if, if Charlie testifies, but I don't know how Charlie would be able to cross-examine um, that video, Dolce Vita, without him giving his interpretation. So you kind of think he has to testify. They're going to be motion in limines. Um, the jury selection could take a week, but, but it's been crazy because the longer it gets, the less likely it's been in the paper. Um, they haven't had a problem getting a jury. I was actually in the jury panel for the last trial. And I think it took, my guess was three to four days to get the jury. And the first day, what they did is they, they bring everybody in individually and the lawyer it's like in chambers and the judge will say, okay, do you know any of the parties? Have you read anything? Have you heard anything? And they, they started a system of, 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 of isolating people that may know too much or know people before they got into the meat of it. They thought that would go quicker. And that's how judge, that's how judge Wheeler did it. I imagine he'll do it the same way. Um, so I would take at least four days for jury selection. And does this trial, will it kick off on uh, October 23rd? We've heard Brian Koberger's trial was set to start October 2nd. That got pushed back already. Every, uh, jurist I've spoken to says there's no way in hell that trial is not starting till at least uh, spring of 2024. But here you think we start uh, roughly around October 23rd? Well, I saw Judge Wheeler and his wife, who I know very well, at the funeral also. Um, you remember now, he's on a civil docket. He's not on the criminal docket. So he is specifically moving all of his cases civilly to try this case. So he's going to try this case when he put it, he put it down on the docket. Because he doesn't have that much, he's not able to to move, accommodate things as much as if he was on the criminal docket. Lest anyone think that uh, Tim Jansen does not know Tallahassee, uh, the judge here, Judge Wheeler, was a fraternity brother of Tim Jansen, so they know each other uh, quite. He was well. my little brother in my fraternity. Little brother, any jealousy or mahogany? I can guarantee you that, as I am, uh, Judy. Uh, your response is Tim on point. Will this jury selection take three or four days? Uh, will it get off without a hitch? Do you think? I think so. And also to address the, it was kind of a comment in jest that Tim is the Debbie Downer. I mean, I, I agree with Tim, you know, I mean, again, don't shoot the messenger because I had Jeremy Mutz on my show. He thought that the chances of Charlie getting convicted is only 60% which I think is kind of low. I would like to think it's more like 80 to 90%. But, you know, I mean, Jeremy actually worked in that prosecutor's office for probably more than a decade, I think. He worked for and, Willie. Huh? He worked for Willie Maggs. Yes. And he also didn't think that more of the Adelson family would get arrested or indicted in the future. So, I mean, we would, most of us would like to see Wendy arrested. Um, but I think based on what's publicly available, the chances of that seem kind of low to me. Can I add uh, something here, guys? 
hundred percent, John. Go jump right I've been, in. I've been a juror on three criminal trials before, and if you were to lay out in the new criminal trial Wendy's case, and then back after that Donna's case, I would think that evidence is so overwhelming against Wendy. It just it's it's a mountain compared to a, a molehill against um, against Donna. Again, that's just my opinion. But I think if a competent attorney, if someone came in there, laid out the facts like a Creighton Waters in the Murdoch case, I think he's a he's a textbook great uh, forceful prosecutor. And you laid out that kind of case to me as a juror, that'd be overwhelmingly a conviction, in my opinion, in most courtrooms. All right. And I think that's a good point. And uh, just for the record, I guess Susan, John and myself would be the jurors in this case. Um, from everything I've heard from Carl's list, um, I don't think I would have trouble uh, convicting Wendy at this point if I was a juror, uh, the way that Carl has meticulously laid it out. Um, and I'm sure uh, Georgia, who has been a guest on the show, is looking, uh, you know, she's a smart woman. I'm sure she's looking at Carl uh, and taking the uh, cherry picking some points uh, of his. Uh, Andrew Mack says, uh, Tim, to you, is there a chance Charlie and Sigfredo Garcia uh, end up in the same prison? That would be uh, an odd thing. Huh? No, they'd, they'd separate them. They, they'd, they'd make sure to separate them. Okay. Yeah, they'd separate them. And Carl, can you elaborate on this from Happy Camper? Uh, and I'll tell you a little story before you answer. Carl, when you mention Aryan Nation in prison, do you think that Charlie is particularly vulnerable because he is Jewish? So I was... Uh, just to stay in shape, I'm no fighter, I'm a lover, but I was taking boxing lessons with a guy from uh, California who used to be the number four heavyweight in the world. And uh, shout out, I can mention his name, Josh Dempsey. He also happens to be the grandson of the great boxer, Jack Dempsey. And Josh, along his way, got into some trouble, spent about seven years here in a hard time. And uh, I said, would we be friends in prison? And he said, 100% not because you're Jewish. I would not be allowed to be friends with you. You're given a pamphlet the first day uh, with uh, something like, uh, you know, it's a, it's like a Carl list of 100 reasons why Jews are no good. Uh, and you get that in prison, and there's a tremendous uh, vitriol, hatred, animosity. There are specific prisons for Jewish people because of that. So uh, to Carl's point, um, and Carl, feel free to elaborate. I think he's going to get, uh, he's going to get, in some trouble just because of his uh, religion. I'm sad to say that, but it's a hard fact. But uh, you care to elaborate? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've not ever represented an Aryan Nation person, but from what I know about their history, I mean, they are full of hate and uh, they're like neo Nazi types. And so obviously, uh, you have a Jewish uh, inmate there uh, near your cell. There, there, it's going to be one, one terrible experience for him and then of course you got other gangs that are so violent and they're so willing to at the dr drop of something so minor just just take somebody's life so um it, it's it's going to be um something where maybe charlie begs to go in the hole and live there you know with the, without any other uh, contact from other folks so he has it so easy right now spending all the time on the phone i've I've never heard of a jail that allowed that. Is that normal there in Tennessee, Tim? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Pre-trial yeah. inmates can just basically be on the phone, dialing it up, living it up, having all these conversations with folks. I mean, most jails have limited visiting hours. They're only on weekends for a few hours. And uh, even state prisons, they don't they don't allow this um, all this lollygagging going on. So what, what do you what do you say about that? Well, in Leon County Jail, you have to have money on the phone that you can buy phone privileges you don't get free phone calls a lot of those people there don't have money to put up for the phone calls and so he might just be hogging it because he had money in his account in his canteen um i have represented an Aryan nation person and i can tell you um he would be in danger within 24 hours mm -hmm. right tim you said he would be in danger in 24 oh yeah oh yeah they they, they have they have, it's amazing the violence and hatred that they have for child molesters and other groups and Jewish people would be one. I wanted to mention something about this spitting incident with Charlie and I, this wasn't, this inmate was definitely not 
an Aryan Nation individual, but it was a, I don't feel comfortable saying the name, of course, but it was a person of Middle Eastern descent. And as we all know, uh, Jews don't always get along with Muslims. So it sounded maybe like that could have been some uh, animosity or some kind of cultural exchange between them. Um, and I also wanted to mention something to Carl. I like that you also agreed about Wendy's, in Wendy's guilt video, that you agreed that her writing in her book on page 96, that she wanted to play the character that killed her husband was kind of suspicious. Exactly. That no, definitely I, stuck out to me as well. No, I, I saw the podcast you had with uh, Judy um, talking about a lot of the stuff that creeped you out. And, and I didn't get to see all of it, but I, I did see that um, that there was some other stuff in there as well that we don't even have on our list yet that are indicators that that she had such a deep seething hatred for Dan. I mean, it's really I, I don't know anybody that hates anybody as much as Wendy hated Dan. And so if you stop to think about it. She was funneling all that hatred of Dan down to her family in Miami. So they got him so worked up that they're willing to, you know, risk going to prison for life to take out Dan. So um, she was the one feeding, feeding the beast, so to speak. And but when you stop to think about it, really, it started with her. And she had to have known that she's ginning this up because she actually said that they were talking about killing him. So if she had any kind of heart for her kids, she would sit there and go, wait a minute, I got to backtrack here because. Charlie talks about doing a hit on him and, and this kind of stuff. So she would, she would have put the brakes on that. But what do we see? She never put the brakes on anything. She just kept on fueling the flames about how, you know, Dan is such a horrible, disgusting human being and that kind of stuff. All lies, right? So, and then Dan had the goods on her in the court filing. So she was about to go down and lose her job because Dan had all the clout at the law school as a as an, a full-time tenured professor where she was just an adjunct on a contract basis. And she could have been, you know, let go at any moment. So from, from misconduct. So I think dad had, Dan had the upper hand. He, she was the one following him around in his career. He was the, uh, he was the, uh, the star there at the law school. So all this kind of stuff, all circles around Wendy way more than like, like John also mentioned, way more than what we have, um, hatred from Donna. Granted, Donna was fueling the flames, and and we saw that email about the uh, you know dressing up the boys as Hitler Youth and changing their changing their religion just to force Dan to capitulate and agree to to move the boys' uh, custody down to Miami. There, but she it, yeah, she also throws shade at the Markels, uh, at Ruth Markel and Phil Mar Markel twice in the book, saying that she would never want to be called uh, by the you know Mrs. Uh, Lily Stone, like she never wants to be called by Dan's smart last, that's her mother-in-law's name. Or, And then the other one was, uh, she just had a dream in a side note in the book, she had a dream that she would, would uh, totally freak out and leave the country if her in-laws were going to move to the same city as her or help her to raise her children, which I just thought was so bizarre to write that in a book. But thank you for watching that. <laughs> Right. That part I did see. Yeah. So that's sort of like who would write that about because she was basically writing the book uh, as a mirror for what she f expressed about in her own heart about how she felt about the Markells, not just Dan, Andrew. like you're saying, but also the rest of the family tree. So, I mean, somebody has to be really full of hatred to do that. And um, I mean, Dan never abused her and whatnot. So whatever differences they had um, for her, for them to go to that extreme. And then to sit there and think that if they never get prosecuted for it, that that's a pretty sad commentary on justice down there. So I, I I'm going to remain optimistic. Um, they don't have to look at this any of this uh, stuff on YouTube to see the evidence that they have. In fact, I'm sure they have even more evidence that uh, of, of their guilt. The the problem is a lot of times what I've seen, uh, and I, I'll say it again, is that attorneys do not do their homework. They don't study in detail, the police reports, they don't formulate strategies enough. They sort of just take it, put put witnesses up on a witness list, and then sort of go in there and, and, and wing it. And um, I've seen that more from defense counsel than from prosecutors, but that, that's a good recipe for losing cases. So if you get a good prosecutor on this case, 
and you take it to trial, you will, I'm very confident, win the case. Because jurors, I've never been a juror like, like John said he has, but jurors get it. And just like Murdo, you had way more naysayers about um, whether he was going to go down or not with a conviction. And look what a slam dunk that was. I mean, the jury was only out a couple hours. And I, I think that's a, that's a stronger case because they had more uh, forensic case in terms of uh, his guilt. But ultimately, you have a great long timeline showing how Wendy was treating Dan and the way that the hatred was and the way she uh, was trying to conveniently not be a part of some phone calls, but some, some of others as well. And maybe she does have the uh, WhatsApp information. I know, uh, Susan, a while ago you put something out about uh, do they have that kind of WhatsApp? Uh, I really want to know yeah. if they have the WhatsApp. <laughs> So I, I think they, they could. The question is, are they have they even looked for it? You know, a lot of times prosecutors and law enforcement, they they don't think of looking for the obvious. So hopefully that's that's not the case. And um, so I'm I'm going to I'm going to believe that justice will be done still here in the near future. Big thanks to our amazing panel. Uh, thank you also to Preston Scott, who is host of the Preston Scott show since 2002. Uh, for those who do not know Judy Zhang, she is uh the founder and owner of the Wake Law Office and also has her own YouTube channel, Asian American Legal Focus. Uh, she's also commenting. She multitasks. Uh, <laughs> she writes, it would also need to be upheld on appeal. Uh, Judy, your final thoughts uh, on this. Uh, I said we don't call it an anniversary. An anniversary is a happy occasion, but nine years since Dan Markell was gunned down in his Tallahassee driveway. Your your final thoughts before yeah. we say goodbye. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that we're all here together to commemorate the life of Dan Markell and glad that we have built a community of people across the whole world who care about the Markell family and will do what we can to continue to spotlight this horrible crime. Yeah, uh, Judy will be doing that. We'll all be doing our part to try to uh, get the spotlight out there. Dateline, by the way, is doing another to our episode that will be coming out in the fall, I believe. Sensory Combustion, double feature tonight. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in about 33 minutes, we are doing a special on the Long Island serial killer with an unbelievable panel, uh, just like this one. Uh, John Steinbeck and Carl Steinbeck, uh, they are brothers. Uh, Carl is a lieutenant colonel retired, a JAG in the military. He now has a Steinbeck law firm and he hosts his own YouTube channel, Jury Trial Mentor. Uh, with John Steinbeck, who is also here. Uh, John, you first, your final thoughts here. And John, give a shout out to your YouTube channel as well. Oh, hold on, I got you muted. I'm sorry, that's my fault. Uh, let me go ahead, John. My YouTube channel is called Brainwashing Children. And obviously, uh, Carl and I started our own channel called Jury Trial Mentor, which is a fledgling channel. We're only covering this case right now, but we plan on after uh, Charlie's hopeful hopeful conviction we'll be covering other cases um and my comment on this case is i have a lot of confidence in jack campbell uh he is the vice president of the uh, florida prosecution association i don't know the exact acronym uh, i think he's got the grit to go forward and yes sadly we're here at nine years and we only have we only have one of the three adelsons sitting in jail but i think that they have a calendar right now. I believe that they have a calendar. They know what they're going to do. And they're just watching this stuff. If they are going, well, these guys don't know it. They, they don't know what we have planned, but we have something planned. And I do not believe that they will let Wendy go unscathed or Donna. I think they're going to go after them. And I think after Charlie's conviction in the fall, I think they're going to have renewed vigor and confidence. And uh, if I was Wendy or Donna, I'd watch out. Strong uh, cautionary tale for uh, Wendy and Donna. Uh, Carl, uh, let me unmute you. And uh, you spearheaded a list of reasons to indict Wendy Adelson. Your final thoughts uh, as we come very close to nine years since Dan was murdered. I would just have to say that uh, thanks for having us on this show. I, I think it's important to, do, to speak about uh, matters of injustice that are ongoing and uh, this is a case that cries out for justice. It calls out for somebody who has courage to prosecute it. I believe that they cannot ignore the evidence. It's that compelling, that strong. And they will have the right prosecution team. And they will prosecute her. They will indict her. And they will get the conviction. And they will do the right thing. And uh, my, that's, that's my uh, 
that's my belief that they will have the courage to do the right thing. And therefore there will be more arrests because all they have to do is get the indictment and then do their job and they will get convictions on other Adelson. So I can't imagine they would leave this on the table just for the sake that the fact that they don't have confidence in themselves or they don't care to look at the evidence in enough detail. I, I believe that they will have to do this. And I think having more light on it, like you're saying with the 2020 on there as well, is this going to shed more light, more attention to the fact that injustice has still not been done to the Dan Markell family, but it is going to come down. Uh, just, just keep watching and, and uh, cheering on the prosecutors to do the right thing. Thank you. Uh, Susan Harmon otherwise known as True Lifestyle. She's been breaking down the jailhouse calls from Charlie on her YouTube channel, which is True Lifestyles. Uh, Susan, your final thoughts on this yeah. uh, sad day of remembrance. I just want to give a big hug to the Markell family. And I think that as long as, you know, th this delay with the, I guess, the alleged bar mitzvah that has delayed the trial will probably just be one more diabolical orchestrated example that the Adelsons have completely alienated the Markells from the boys. I hope that it's not true. They might invite the Markells, but as long as the state proves this very detailed timeline of the just complete sinister plot of alienation of the Markells and hatred towards Dan and leading up to his unfortunate death, it just will be a something that the jurors will see. And I'm hopefully confident that there are no curveballs and that this will proceed with no, no more delays. I am uh, proud to now call him a friend. He is famed Tallahassee defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen, a partner in the firm that bears his name, Jansen and Davis. He has handled all kinds of complex civil administratives, criminal litigation, uh, and he also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. Uh, Tim, I know you and Carl keep going back. Wendy will be indicted. Wendy will not be indicted. Wendy will not be indicted. Wendy will be indicted. Uh, let's leave that aside for the time being. What is your final thought here as uh, we come on the uh, nine-year mark of Dan being murdered in his driveway, not far from where you live, I don't think, and uh, a murder that really... Uh, put Tallahassee on the map in a, in a tainted sort of way, which hopefully there will be justice uh, meted out as a result. Tim, your final thoughts. Well, we all want justice for Dan and for his family and for his boys. Um, I don't take great pleasure in saying that I, that I personally believe there's not enough evidence to indict her or convict her. I have all confidence in jurors. Jurors see common sense. Jurors will be able to, go through what Carl mentioned, her behavior, and they'll see through it. You know, in that that Murdoch trial, all those talking heads were claiming they don't have enough evidence. They don't, he's going to be not guilty. And I think you remember I told you he's going to be convicted on all charges. And jurors get it right, and they try to do the right thing. There's not any sympathy for uh, Wendy or for any of the Adelsons. My concern is that it hasn't happened. I spoke to some people. And their, their response was, well, we have to have evidence. And that, you know, you can indict and, you know, they're not easy cases. And murder cases sometimes aren't easy cases. But the juries get it. You got circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence is just as strong as direct evidence. People never understand that. Circumstantial evidence can be a stronger case than eyewitness testimony, for example. Almost all the cases on death penalty that were overturned were based on eyewitness testimony. DNA came back and exonerated people. So I'm hopeful that there will be more charges, but the pace they're moving doesn't give me a lot. Comments I'm hearing doesn't give me a lot of confidence that anytime soon Wendy or Donna will be charged. But who knows? It could change. And Jack is a, a very good prosecutor. He's a career prosecutor. Um, he's not one to not take a, a difficult case. So hmm. let's hope justice is done for Dan. And it could be the sobering truth. Roxanne says, thank you, great panel. Tim getting beat up. I still disagree with Tim, but everyone still loves his hair. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Roxanne. Yeah, my so that's all I That might be my sister. I have a sister named Roxanne. There you go. Roxanne 
Roxanne. I love it. Um, till next time, a quick reminder in 25 minutes, we are doing a two hour special on the Long Island serial killer. By the way, they discovered those bodies in 2010 and uh, the police were onto this guy much, uh, not long after, uh, but it has taken 13 years to uh, make an arrest. So sometimes justice, uh, the long arm of justice just does take a while to catch up. Uh, that is another case that needs a lot of scrutiny and uh, we will be on it in 25 minutes with an unbelievable panel just like this one thanks to sts nation love you america love you tallahassee florida love you texas love you north carolina and everywhere in between thanks everybody